thank you all for coming to the last session of the day. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is some work that I've been doing <coughs> with, with my collaborators at Harvard to try and explain why species vary in the amount of nutrient diversity um, within the human population. So our intuition from the neutral theory of molecular evolution is that species with very large population sizes, like say yourself in Melanogaster, should have a lot of nutrient diversity. And species with relatively small population sizes, like for example, um, the big horn sheep, should have relatively little diversity. And so this intuition has been formalized, um, and our sort of prediction from basic neutral theory is that what should determine the amount of neutral genetic variation within a population um, is, so, the amount of neutral so the amount of neutral diversity, which I am showing here as the average pairwise difference between two chromosomes, um, should be determined by the population size n and the mutation rate. And so this is in the context of a sort of standard right Fisher neutral model where um, the population size is constant, there's no selection, there's no migration. And so this would predict that genetic variation should increase directly proportionally but in reality, we actually don't see this particularly strong correlation. And what I'm showing you here is um, some data re-plotted from a recent review paper in Plus Biology. And this is in red here. I'm showing you the, um, the sort of range of, of pi that you see across about 150 species that these folks looked at. And you know, pi spans maybe three orders of magnitude. But the, our sort of understanding of the population size of life is that there's a huge range of, of um, population sizes. And so there's a discrepancy here, there's a paradox. We expect there to be much more neutral diversity among species than there actually is. And so what could possibly explain this? Why do we not see as much neutral diversity as we might expect? So again, I'm showing you our sort of neutral expectation, the expectation of the sort of average pairwise difference between two chromosomes in a population is going to be so obviously one thing that could explain this is if the mutation rate, mu, is inversely pro proportional to the population size, then as populations get bigger, the mutation rate gets lower, and so neutral diversity will not be correlated with population size in the way that you would um, predict from the neutral theory. Of course, we also know that the model is here, and uh, you know, we probably, everyone's probably aware that the effect of population size is typically not equal to the actual sense of population size. What I want to focus on today you about how natural selection can reduce or eliminate the dependence of neutral diversity on population size and show you some evidence for why this might be a place to focus on. And so how does natural selection affect neutral diversity? Well, it, in particular, what I'm going to focus on is the role of um, linked selection on um, neutral diversity. And so what we're showing you here is a population of chromosomes where each of the purple dots represents neutral variation, and this black star is a deleterious so this is a process called background selection where over time the chromosomes that acquire deleterious mutation will, will, will be lost from the population or destined never to fix. And so that will end up reducing the amount of variation. Um, any, any neutral mutation like, for example, this one that's linked to a deleterious mutation will die. Something very similar can occur via the action of positive selection. So now I'm showing you again the same uh, population of chromosomes here where And now this red star is a, is a beneficial mutation that is destined to be fixed in the population. And as this sweeps through the population over time, all the neutral variants that are not on that fixing haplotype are also lost. And so both of these two processes, genetic hitchhiking and background selection, will result in the removal of variation, um, by, of, of linked neutral variation by selection. And so this might suggest that if the strength of selection, if the impact of selection on neutral diversity in our genome is correlated with population size. So the bigger your population size, your census population size, the larger the impact of selection. Then that could explain why um, we do not see a, a strong correlation between population size and neutral diversity as we might expect. And this has been well explored theoretically uh, for many years, starting back in the 70s with a paper by uh, John Maynard Smith and Haig. And, but there's been very little sort of what I'd like what, what we, the 
excited to do was that if we could come up with a way of measuring the impact of selection on our genome, so if we can measure the strength of selection, then we would be able to actually develop an empirical test that would, that would um, provide an insight into whether this, this theoretical prediction holds. And so how might we do that? Well, this is, I guess, why I'm in the recombination section. We take advantage of the fact that the impact of selection on repeat diversity depends on the recombination. So now I'm showing you here this hitchhiking scenario where the red circle is the beneficial mutation of drug Rubix and the blue circles are the neutral, linked neutral alleles, and these are a population of chromosomes. And so in order for a neutral allele to persist, it has to recombine onto the fixing chromosome. It has to recombine onto this chromosome that has the beneficial mutation. So re in reason the blow recombination that's going to occur rarely, and so a lot of variation is going to occur there. But in regions of high recombination, that would occur more frequently, and so less variation is there. And so this, this process predicts that there will be a correlation between recombination rate and neutral diversity. And the stronger that correlation is, the larger we can infer that the impact of selection on our genome holds. And so this was actually shown uh, more than 20 years ago now by Chip Quadro and David Gunn. Um, but I can show it again with more modern data. So this is in Drosophila melanogaster, the recombination rate, and a measure of neutral diversity. So this is high. And you can see that there's a very strong positive correlation here. So we would infer that there's, in this species, that uh, selection has had a big impact on neutral diversity, that linked selection has really removed a lot of variation. Of course, we can do slightly better than just look at correlations. And so I'm going to skip over a lot of the details of the in the interest of time, but we were able to build a coalescent model that, um, so again, now I'm showing you the exact same data, right, the recombination rate um, for each, these are for 580 windows across the genome, so each point here is the data for one window. Uh, this is the recombination rate and the neutral diversity. And um, what we were able to do then is build a model that would predict, based on taking into account the impacts of background selection and the impacts of hitchhiking, what we would expect to observe given that recombination rate and that level of gene density. And this, so this uh, purple line is the model prediction. What we can also get out of this model, I'd be happy to talk about it in more detail later, it builds on a lot of history in the field of um, um, these kinds of models. I do not, it's not, you know, this is not something that is beloved in from our cells. We can also infer what the, what the sort of expected neutral pie would be in the absence of selection on this coalescent model. And so we can then come up with a measure of the strength of selection simply as one minus the ratio of the pie that the variation that we observe um, in the species that we're looking at divided by what we would expect in the absence of selection. And so this gives us a scale that runs from zero to one where um, if the strength of selection is, uh, is zero, observed pie is equal to our inferred neutral pie. And so impact of selection on the genome. If it's um, one, then that would mean there's a very strong impact of selection. And so then we wanted to take data for as many species and animals as we could, animals and plants as we could, calculate this strength of selection, and ask whether this strength of selection correlates with uh, population size, which is what we would predict if um, so this kind of linked selection is an important process for shaping so in order to do this, we need to be able to estimate recombination rate for the for a genome and we need, for a species, and we need to be able to estimate genome-wide polymorphism. And so in order to do this, we need the following things. We need a high-quality um, genome, so it has to be a chromosomal scale assembly so that we can estimate recombination rate. We need a high-density genetic map. We need whole genome polymorphism. Um, and to simplify our lives, we decided to focus purely on So we were able to find the requisite data sets for 23 animals and 16 plants that cover a reasonable range of you know, diversities, obviously biased by the kinds of species, say mammals, where people have uh, sequenced genomes. And I'm just gonna very briefly give you a, a quick rundown of the pipelines for estimating polymorphism, uh, estimating pi, and estimating recombination rate. So in order to estimate polymorphism, we wanted to focus on a consistent set of neutral sites. So we wanted to look at only, so we're only gonna look at um, four full degenerate sites, and we pick that so that we can use both RNA-seq data and DNA-seq data into our pipeline. And we 
just do a sort of standard align against the genome, uh, use TNC paint to call the SNPs, and then um, estimate pi and then do some flow regression. To estimate recombination rate, um, we rely on the fact that if we have a, so this I'm showing you data from the maze chromosome one, and if you focus on the, this graph to start, each one of these points represents an estimate, a marker that where we know its physical position, and we also know its position on the genetic map. And so we can estimate the recombination rate based on fitting a function to this line and then taking the derivative of that function. And that's what I'm showing you over here. We can do various degrees of smoothing. But from this kind of approach, we can get both whole genome polygraphing data and whole genome estimates of recombination rate. And so then, of course, this is now where we want to test. We want to measure. We can now use our coalescent model to estimate the structural selection and ask whether that's correlated with population size. Now, of course, we don't want to use diverse neutral diversity to estimate population size because this goes into the data structural selection. So instead, we decided to use two potential proxies for population size. So the first thing that we're going to look at is species range. So of course, we're making a lot of assumptions here, but in general, if species are roughly the same density, then species with a larger range and having bigger populations are the same. And we actually find that there's a significant and fairly strong correlation between geographic range, which I'm showing you here. This is um, the log 10 square kilometers of our, of our estimated range. These are often imprecise estimates. And our strength of selection. So range of positively correlated strength of selection. This is what we predict from our hypothesis. We can also use mass. Mass is actually much easier to measure for most species than range. And we would expect, or else think to be the rule, that a species with a higher mass is likely to have a lower population size. So now we expect a negative correlation. And in fact, that's exactly what we this is in fact stronger and uh, explains more of the variation, which um, could be just because it's the mean. So together, mass and range explain almost 50% of the variation in the strength of selection and in the direction that we expect if our hypothesis is true. So this puts us in a world where species with small population sizes are operating under a genetic drift model. But species with large population sizes are probably almost all of the neutral diversity in the genome is being shaped by this process of mean selection, and that's removing a dependence on population size. And so with that, I'd just like to thank my co-authors, um, uh, grad students in the lab, and my postdoc mentor, Dan Hargill, funding people for comments and images. And with that, I will take any questions that you might have. And you can read the preprint on my archive. So we found that if we had um, markers spaced, say maybe five tenthomorgans apart, the major marker spacing, something like that, that we were empirically getting pretty robust estimates. There's a few where we were going out to ten, but more than ten, more than ten centimorgans.